everyone, welcome back to an episode of the Open Source Cafe, and uh, today we're going to talk about OAMs. So before we get started, we have Daniel here joining us from Naptiv, and uh, Daniel, thanks a lot for uh, coming on the show. Would you like to give yourself a quick intro? Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Daniel Ligero at the City of Naptiv, and I'm involved on the OEM and Google our communities as a maintainer of both. So yeah. Amazing, a lot of projects, you know, uh, around it, and specifically when we talk about application delivery, for example, like an application, like you know, deploying apps. People say deploy app deployment is very hard, and and yeah. uh, so many challenges uh, associated with it. So, can you tell us a little bit more about what uh, OAM is, and maybe you can define that, and uh, let's start with that, and then we can talk about uh, the challenges. Sure. Yeah. So basically, the OAM, which stands for Open Application Model. It's a specification uh, that helps you understand how to write down basically what an application is for you, uh, which are their components, and how they should be basically uh, deployed on a cluster. And that is uh, somehow different if we take a look to how people usually uh, approach these type of problems. Instead of thinking from the details upwards, kind of like if we have a lot of microservices, we start thinking about microservices connecting then between uh, well, among themselves. And then all of that becomes kind of a logical entity, which we can refer to as an application. Uh, what OEM does is uh, let's start thinking from the application downwards. Like we want to have an understanding if an application in itself, like in which state it is, like it is running or why it's not running or what are we deploying right now, which is the version and so on. So OEM basically enters into that picture in the sense of let's have a small a comprehensive, let's say, definition in a language that is portable, uh, that is agnostic from the runtime that we are using, which is also quite important from the point of view of OEM. Like we usually will see OEM right now in Kubernetes, but from the point of view of the specification, that doesn't necessarily need to happen. Like the application definition can be then uh, implemented in many different runtimes, right? So the idea of uh, OEM, as I said, is let's have uh, an application definition in which you will basically define which are the components that are part of your application, which are their parameters, which is also that sometimes we forget pretty easily, like we are used to go and take a container image figure out which are the different parameters, environment variables that it takes, and then configuring them uh, every time we want to deploy them. With OEM, you can basically define parameters for a specific component. So it also allows you to standardize the components, for example, if you are working in an organization, or simplify the way that you interact with components. If somebody in the team is creating a component and somebody else is using it, he just needs to go and say, hey, these are the parameters that are defined, and this is the effect they have on, on my component, right? And uh, also, you have another entity called trait, which are basically a way to extend a component without basically modifying the component in itself. Like, for example, if you want a component and you want to take the logs for that component and export them into another system, you can plug a trait in it that will take the uh, logs and send them to another uh, entity, another framework, without needing basically to modify the container image or talking with the developer of the container image in itself, right? So I think that those are, let's say, the two key elements from OEM. And the idea is, as I said, that you will be able to have a single YAML that will contain the specification from your application. And that also enables you to have this big picture of what is going on on your system. That's interesting because most of the developers I have spoken to, um, when they talk about it, it's like we just want to focus on you know defining like the application or whatever, and not worry about uh, spending time on infrastructure details like like you know DNS ingress or whatever. Yeah. Um, and with things getting like with microservices even more complex, I think it's it's not really fair for devs to take care of this um, 
along with this challenge, like what are the challenges? I, if you want to talk about, like we talk about what's, what's AM and uh, maybe now we can talk a little bit more about some of the challenges it's solving in, 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 in brief. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I think one of the, what you just mentioned is one also of the critical points I think we are reaching uh, as the cloud evolves and the providers become more different. Uh, what happens sometimes is that if you come new to a new developer team in a new company, for example, uh, you are suddenly faced with needing to become an expert in their cloud provider, in the framework that they are using, in the technology that they are using. And finally, you need to think about which is the business that they are trying to, to run and which are the problems that you need to actually solve, right? So I think that sometimes it becomes basically unfeasible to think that everyone should become an expert in every cloud provider just to deploy a single component or small application, right? And moreover, because if we take a look to Kubernetes, for example, each cloud provider has their own specifics for it. So knowing Kubernetes is not enough sometimes. You may know Kubernetes in AWS and you may start another project in Azure and suddenly some of the things no longer work as you expected, right? Because there are minor instances and differences that you suddenly need to become an expert to, to be able to navigate and deploy your same application into different cloud providers, for example, right? So what OEM does at the end of the day is to move one layer up, one structure layer up, and you will uh, basically specify how your application works uh, that just requires that every component uh, lives, let's say, in a container. That's the requirement that you have. And after that, you will delegate like how you actually deploy those components into a particular framework and cloud provider to the runtime, right? And that is where Kubebella enters the, the picture into in the OAM world. Amazing. And uh, thanks a lot for sharing about, you know, we discussed about you know what it is and the challenges it's solving. Because there's something I've seen like repetitively, you know, with yeah. people. There's no, there's no like, uh, from Dev's point of view, single sort of uh, truth, ideally. Um, yeah. Yeah. The end, this is like, uh, as we are discussing these days, it's more like the same that you are seeing a, a movement in terms of GitOps. Uh, sometimes this is more focused, let's say, on per component, uh, let's say, level. Uh, what this type of things allows you to do at the end of the day is to say, hey, if I want to deploy my application, this is the file that I need to run. And I'm sure where that file lives. Because another problem that we are seeing uh, sometimes is that to deploy, let's say, a complex application uh, that is composed by many different microservices, you need to figure out which are the Git repositories that contain YAML files, how you render them, how you come to them, so it becomes quite uh, complex sometimes just to navigate among the components that you have, right? Yeah, couldn't agree more. And while we were talking about previously, like folks working on configuring or de like developing their application, and you mentioned about various environments. So now we're seeing like there's, let's say, maybe it's on-prem or some cloud provider or maybe like edge devices, for example. So when we talk about your the the runtime environments right the infrastructure so I think if 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 that provides a lock in uh, then it gets a little bit difficult for people to configure for various environments as well yeah yeah I mean I think one of the complexities that we are seeing uh, especially when you talk with new people that is coming into this world is that uh, the cloud was supposed to simplify our lives and now you take any cloud provider you will see a list of 150 services that you are supposed to be expert on to see how you plug <laughs> and you create your application uh, among that, right? So at the end of the day, is a huge complexity layer that basically puts away a lot of people because they don't want to, they don't want to go through that effort to understand that. And more importantly, they shouldn't need to do that, right? Maybe my work is not on, I'm not a developer, I'm just a user of the infrastructure that is provided by, by the company I work on. And I should be able to access those resources without needing to become quite an expert. Like, 
like for example, uh, we are seeing people more on the field uh, on machine learning, for example, data scientists, people that can highly benefit for having infrastructure ready to use, but they shouldn't become experts in cloud providers. They should be experts in their fields, right? Like how you create the model, how you train them, how you get the best model for, for your back, basically. Yeah, couldn't agree more. So talk about the challenges, talk about how it can benefit you. Let's talk more about some action items. So how do we implement OAM? And can you maybe share some of the, if someone wants to yeah. start today to implement it, like let's say for a, like for getting started and taking that to like a production use case. So uh, I will say, the, so let's introduce first what is Kubella because it's a key component to make OEM a reality. Kubella uh, is a CNCF project that is uh, the OEM runtime for Kubernetes. That means you will be able to create OEM entities in Kubernetes and Kubella will be the operator taking those entities, understanding them, processing them and creating a bunch of resources in the Kubernetes field with the low level Kubernetes entities, let's say, right? So for example, if you have an application with two components on the OEM world that is likely to be translated into a couple of deployments in Kubernetes plus their services, plus their configurations, maybe an ingress, things like that, right? That is the key element that translates between the two, right? And for getting started, uh, I think the easiest way probably is <clears throat> create a small cluster. If you are familiar with this type of uh, management, like a kind Minikube cluster, you can deploy Kubella on it and start playing around with the getting started guides. Uh, I work at a company uh, called Native that we also provide a method for you to experience OEM just by creating an account in the in our platform, which is also a way if you don't want to get the, the resources or install your own clusters to, to work with that. And the easiest way possible, I think, is like we usually uh, put the sample of WordPress, which I think is kind of the hello world in the cloud native world, right? Uh, so that's a pretty simple application with a couple of components that will help you understand like, hey, how can I represent my application into OEM? How can I extend and configure the different components? And once you have that running, you can start thinking about what is next, right? Like what else can we do to improve all of this stuff, right? From the community, let's say of Kubella, uh, there are a lot of people uh, working with production environments uh, on this, which is also quite important. This is not just an idea. There are people running their production workloads with OEM. And at least you can think of, uh, yeah, a lot of use cases that cover that from people having just Google installed in a cluster uh, to manage the deployments in the same cluster to be able to deploy uh, applications in different clusters, different cloud providers. Uh, the uh, runtime also provides a lot of add-ons that enable you basically to plug other uh, Kubernetes tools, let's say in that area. For example, you can have integrations with uh, Flux or Argo to work with in more in a GitOps oriented uh, workflow, right? But deploying OEM components. So at the, end, at the end of the day, I think one of the benefits of OEM, Kubebella and this type of approach is that this not only focuses on pretty simple applications. It's not just focused on having one, two components and that's it. You can run as complex as application as you want and you can build your own scenario. So complexity in that sense is not a limitation per se in the, both in the standards or in the runtime. And uh, do you think like maybe folks might uh... Confused like it with the uh, if we talk about Kubevela versus maybe Helm, how those are different? Yeah, yeah. Uh, sometimes when we talk about OEM, people uh, will always say like, "Hey, but Helm's already exist," uh, or things like that. I think that uh, one of the differences uh, between both approaches, uh, as you can think of, is 
I should help more as how you package a standard, let's say, low-level Kubernetes entities. And for that, you use uh, the, the templates that a lot of people already has uh, worked with in Helm. Uh, the main problem I see with Helm is maintainability. Uh, if you have started to create your own charts, uh, you will experience how uh, lovely it is with, to work with those templates, especially when a lot of people on a team are touching them and updating them. So that can become quite complex sometimes. Uh, Helm also, while you can basically get a preview of what is going to be deployed on your system, sometimes it's not that easy because at the end of the day, there are quite a lot of resources that go into the cluster. One of the benefits of OEM is that everything becomes labeled. So if you deploy an application with four components, all the components will have a reference to this parent application. So you can easily track which uh, elements are created in a Kubernetes cluster that are associated with an application. It is something that depending on who created the Helm chart, you may not have the possibility to do. And I think those are kind of the, the main differences. You can, if you want, for example, we've seen a lot of people like, if you are planning into moving in OEM, uh, you can do it also gradually. So for example, you can mix components being uh, references at, hey, deploy this container with this particular image. But you can also mix in between uh, components that will be spawned from a, from a Helm chart, uh, which also helps with this type of migration approaches of proof of concepts where you say, hey, I want to still use this Helm chart because I spent time developing it. But from now on, uh, I would like to use components just referencing the images. I think those are the how you can relate with Helm, but how, why you are different also from, from Helm. Yeah, yeah, because I had like, uh, that was exactly my like concern for some people who might ask that question, because I know people in the comments, they're like. <laughs> yeah, uh, sure, I mean, uh, uh, we know a lot of people which are quite happy with uh, how they work with Helm, but it is true that at the end of the day, this is also like, it's not the same using it as, I mean, if you take the hat of somebody just using the Helm chart as if you are part of a maintainer of a Helm chart, and this is also related with the complexities, right? Like the thing that we say about, do you need to become an expert in cloud and Kubernetes and all the minor nuances uh, to work with, I mean, to deploy an application or deploy just one con component or develop your the functionality that you are working on? I think it's sometimes the same with Helm. Like, Making changes to it and updating Helm charts uh, requires understanding pretty well what is going on, uh, how the Helm chart is going to be rendered, and it's not an easy task if you haven't done it in a while. Couldn't agree more. And uh, you briefly mentioned about like you, you work at Naptive, and since we're on the topic, can you tell us a bit more about what Naptive is? Yeah, so basically the idea of, of Naptive is pretty around the concept of Let's start thinking about applications as logical entities that people are comfortable reasoning about. Like, I want to know if my application is running or not. Uh, I may go down the stream and say, hey, which is the component that is failing? But I would like to have uh, an aggregated view of what is going on before I, before I ask myself that question, right? So what we do is we have an internal development platform that is built around OEM, and Kubella and so on. And what we do is we provide a method for people, first of all, to experience OEM without needing to install any cluster. Uh, we have an application catalog, which is also that uh, people are loving it, uh, which is basically kind of the same that you will have with uh, a container registry, where you have just a storage of different container images. We have done kind of the same, if you wish, but on the application level. So you can go and choose which application you want to deploy. You can tweak the parameters before launching it. And you can just deploy applications to infrastructure without worrying about the infrastructure, right? So our objective is that you should be able to use, uh, you should be able to gain all the benefits from Kubernetes and the cloud without needing to become an expert in both. But at the same time, we don't want to be just a layer in between Right, so if you use native, you can still access the standard Kubernetes API. 
because you may have already some integrations and so on, but if you want the easiest way, we also provide that path. Yeah, it's nice to have options and not limiting people yeah. based on a particular group of, of skill sets. Um, this is what I see, like when I attend, like when I talk to people and when I go to booths and stuff, um, a lot of people face these challenges. And I think it's nice to, as I said, we're talking about it and folks are... Uh, I think of, that... Yeah. Sometimes related with that is also that we are sometimes to focus it on a specific group of people. And we as a developer, as developers, think about developers and infrastructure seems to be quite near developers. But we need to be aware that there are other people that can benefit from using infrastructure and these type of systems. Like, for example, uh, we have made uh, some tests with students. Uh, and it's also a good way for students to do just learn new technologies. Like if you are, are learning a new database, you shouldn't spend the first half an hour trying to make the database run and how to install it and suffering maybe the complexities of installing that database because you are just learning databases, right? Or you are learning, uh, I don't know, Spark, or you are learning any other technology, right? So the same as I said about data scientists, uh, students, uh, a lot of people shouldn't be uh, other basically about learning a lot of stuff because they already have a lot of stuff in their minds like <laughs> yeah it's sometimes it's so this is what i recommend people to do like uh especially when you're getting started I'm not talking about experts I'm not talking about people who yeah. do lives like when you're getting started then like learn on the go and learn enough that you can contribute uh because it, it it's not really practical like okay I want to contribute to this project. I want to use this in my project or use this open source project. First, I will first I will try to be an expert in this and then I'll use it. A lot of time would go by and it'll, it'll be yeah, just... No, yeah. And right now it's, it's kind of unfeasible, right? Like if you take a look to the big data landscape uh, or the CNCF landscape or any other landscape or the cloud landscape, it's quite unapproachable for a newcomer. And even if you are there uh, and you have spent some years in that landscape or environment, uh, it's quite a lot to become an expert in everything. It's, it's impossible, basically. So I agree with you. Like You should be able to get something running and experience it. In. Like We should be able to make proof of concept of things without needing to become an expert just to, to run it the first time, right? Yeah, yeah. Couldn't agree more. And by the way, speaking of it, like, uh, all the links you can find in the description below. Kubevel are getting involved in the community and NapDev and all these other things. So it's open source project. Uh, like you can get involved with it. Uh, and I leave all the links in the GitHub and everything in the description below, so you can check it out. Thanks again for joining, Daniel. It was great talking to you, and definitely uh, it was nice to have a new topic of discussion on my channel. So audience would Thanks definitely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we learned about a new tool today as well. So uh, you now you can get involved, and uh, we'll do some uh, some demos in the future videos. So yeah. Thanks, okay. thanks for watching and see you next one. Great day. Bye. Yeah, thanks.